twilight creeps its weary way through the narrow alleyways and ancient courtyards of the old city and drapes the history-steeped streets in a cloak of sinister shadow. Indistinct forms flit across the weathered walls and cobwebbed windows. Phantom footsteps echo across the time-worn cobbles. A distinct chill hangs heavy in the air. And the city of the dead begins to stir as long-ago residents commence their nightly returns to the places that they knew so well in life. There is an old saying that ghosts only appear in places that have known either great happiness or great sadness, and the City of London has certainly known both in abundance. If there is any truth in the theory that buildings retain vestiges of the events that happen within them, and that their walls can become charged with the energies, personalities, and emotions of former inhabitants, then those at the historic heart of London must have millions of memories crackling away within and beneath their ancient fabrics. In this video, I am going to take you on a tour of the city's haunted hotspots, where we will delve into their dark histories to uncover their sinister secrets, as we hear tales of a host of bygone citizens who have been just dying to make your acquaintance. So, without further ado, let the hauntings commence. We begin our journey on Lombard Street, looking towards its junction with King William Street, where stands the church of St. Mary Woolnoth, designed by Nicholas Hawksmoor and built between 1716 and 1726. It possesses one of the most unusual, if not the most unusual, towers of any city church, and something decidedly unexpected lurks down in its crypt. Let us descend into its depths to find out what that something is. Well, there's a surprise. It's the ticket hall for Bank Underground Station's Northern Line Stop. You see, in the 1890s, the deep-level tube tunnels were beginning to appear under London, and the City and South London Railway was looking to expand into the extremely congested area around Lombard Street. In 1893, the company managed to get an act through Parliament that granted them permission to demolish St. Mary's Church in order to replace it with a nice new underground station. Three years later, the C and SLR began drawing up their plans to develop the site, but they ran into considerable opposition from those old-fashioned diehards who considered an historic church infinitely more preferable to a modern underground station. In the end, a compromise was reached by which the City and South London Railway was given permission to develop the land adjacent to and under the church, but was forbidden from purchasing any part of the church itself. Of course, this compromise meant that the crypt, being very much under the church, was fair game for redevelopment, and so in February 1897, the onerous task of clearing the remains of the seven to 8,000 former parishioners who, it was estimated, had been buried in the crypt, began. Now, to be honest, the crypt had over the years proved something of a nuisance to the delicate sensibilities of worshippers at the church, since the decomposing remains buried just a few feet beneath the floor were wont to give off an effluvia that was so offensive that members of the congregation were not only annoyed by it, but were quite often made ill by it, and the poor clergyman would often go home with a sore throat after officiating at Sunday service. As one account has put it, at times there would be no smell in the church, at others an intolerable odour came up in whiffs and gusts. So when the city and South London Railway acquired the crypt and set about clearing out the human remains located therein, the congregation must have breathed a huge sigh of relief, which was no doubt preceded by the first decent intake of breath they had taken in the church in years. Having carted all the skulls and bones off to a new resting place in the City of London Cemetery at Ilford, the engineers set about inserting steel girders under the church to support the walls and internal columns, while the lifts and staircase shafts for Bank Station were constructed directly beneath the church's floor. It was a remarkable feat of engineering, and the company's claim that it had left the edifice of the church considerably stronger than it had been before they carried out the work was probably a justified one, although I'm no structural engineer, so please don't take my word for it. 
the King William Street side of the church became the station's entrance, although this has since been removed a little further to the west. However, the old entrance still looks out onto King William Street and now houses the lift that transports passengers down to the ticket hall below. Mention of the lift segues nicely into the haunting of the station. In 1982, a member of staff was locking up the station one night after the last train had left. Having checked the lifts, he was walking across the booking hall when he heard a loud knocking noise coming from inside one of the lifts as though a stranded passenger was trying to attract attention. Knowing that he had just checked that lift and that there had been nobody in it, he ignored the sound and walked over to the switch room, the door of which he wedged open as he turned all but the station's emergency lights off. Walking back across the ticket hall, he almost jumped out of his skin when the door he had wedged firmly open suddenly slammed shut behind him with a loud bang. I wouldn't even look back, he told the Channel 5 program Ghosts of the Underground. It scared the life out of me. I nearly made a mess in my trousers, and off I went. That was the last time I was working on that side of the station, and I was glad I never went back. There were also reports in the 1970s and early 1980s that the underground's maintenance personnel disliked working at Bank Station at night because of a strange feeling of despondency and dread which sometimes overcame them. The feeling was, so some that experienced it claimed, often accompanied by a dreadful smell, which they compared to the stench of a newly opened grave. Is it possible that spectral traces of the effluvium from the former crypt of St. Mary Woolnoth had lingered around Bank Station to afflict the night hours and nostrils of the system's maintenance workers? What is certain is that something unexplainable appears to lurk about the ether of Bank Underground Station, and that is why we have begun our ghost hunt here, as it is the haunted underground station of the historic hub of the City of London. Head east past St. Mary Woolnoth, and you stumble into a warren of historic alleyways that snake their way between the soaring walls of buildings that once housed some of our most esteemed financial institutions. Hidden away in this nebulous labyrinth, there is a venerable slice of bygone London, the Georgian Vulture, the origins of which are reputed to stretch back to 1175, when it was simply known as the George. According to an old history of the premises, when the Great Fire of London swept through these alleys, it left the George little more than a shell of charred embers. A wine merchant of George Yard, whose sign was a tethered live vulture, lost his home and his livelihood, and after the tavern was rebuilt, he negotiated with the landlord for part use of the George. Unhappy with the idea of having a live bird squawking around the door, he agreed to change the name of his house to the Georgian Vulture, and thus the hostelry acquired its unusual name. Over the centuries, the Georgian vulture has gathered numerous famous associations. Sir Francis Dashwood, for example, founded his notoriously nefarious Hellfire Club here in the 1730s. But it was Charles Dickens who put the old place firmly on the map when he had Mr. Pickwick take up his abode in a very good old-fashioned and comfortable quarters to wit the Georgian vulture tavern and hotel George Yard, Lombard Street. The Pickwickian room, or Dickens' room as it is now known, on one of the upper floors of the building, has long been pointed out as the chamber occupied by Mr. Pickwick, whilst high up on an outer wall of the premises is emblazoned the legend, Old Pickwickian Hostelry. There is also evidence to suggest that this is the place Dickens had in mind in that most ghostly of ghostly tales, A Christmas Carol, when Ebenezer Scrooge, homeward bound on Christmas Eve, took his melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern. There can be no doubt about it, the Georgian vulture drips with history. And to think this venerable old time capsule was almost lost to us. In February 1951, the building's landlord, Williams Deacon's Bank, announced their intention to demolish the premises and replace it with an office block. Fortunately, Charles Dickens' great-grandson, Cedric Charles Dickens, together with former Lord Mayor of the City of London, Sir Frederick Rowlands, came to the rescue and managed to persuade the bank to grant a reprieve that allowed the Georgian vulture to keep trading as the city's Dickensian restaurant. And it is still trading today more than 70 years later, 
despite the demolition and rebuilding that have seen the cityscape around it change beyond recognition. Patrons can still wolf down generous and delicious portions of girth-expanding fare, just as their forebears did before them, and hopefully just as their future counterparts will do for many years to come. A timeless aura permeates its snug and atmospheric interior, and the moment you step through its creaking doors, you just feel the 21st century beat a hasty retreat behind you. Portraits and photographs of Dickens hang on the walls. A white marble bust of him looks out from a window ledge in the downstairs bar, staring sternly across the dining room, whilst likenesses of his characters along with illustrations from his novels adorn the walls. And a few of those who have enjoyed past associations with the commodious old place have chosen to linger here as spirits. A lady in a grey Victorian dress has been seen in the upstairs rooms. She materialises before astonished witnesses, stands staring at them for a few fleeting moments, and then melts away into thin air. Who she is, or was, and why she haunts the place are unknown. Only the walls are privy to her identity, and they choose to keep it a closely guarded secret. But hers is not the only phantom that has been seen here. In 2006, a waiter went up to the Dickens room and was surprised to see the unmistakable form of Cedric Dickens standing there in his dressing gown. Puzzled, he went downstairs to ask the manager why Cedric was in there, only to be told that Cedric had died just a few days before. From that point on, he refused to go up to the Dickens room, although a manager did once express the suspicion that his fear was little more than a convenient excuse that spared him the exhausting climb up the seemingly endless flights of stairs that lead to the room. The mysterious sound of a bouncing ball has been heard on the stairs and the wooden floorboards, although nobody who hears it actually sees any physical manifestations of either the ball or its bouncer. In 2021, an electrician was working in an upstairs room when he heard the sound of a bouncing ball behind him. He turned to see who or what was making the noise, but found that he was completely alone in the room. Mentioning it to the manager before he left, he was told that he had been honoured by a visit from the tavern's phantom bouncer. Several people photographing the premises from the narrow Bengal court outside have been somewhat surprised when, on looking at their photos, they have seen the faint form of a pale-faced girl in a white mob cap looking down from the first-floor room's bottom middle window pane. The Georgian vulture is certainly a special and historic hostelry, and the ghosts that haunt it appear to be a convivial bunch whose presences add to, rather than detract from, the timelessness of the place. Indeed, such is its old-fashioned charm that it would probably come as a huge disappointment if you discovered that this place of creaking floorboards and dark corners was not haunted. But it is, and long may it continue to be so. According to Psychic News, one of the most intriguing haunted churches in Britain can be found on Garlic Hill in the heart of Old London. The church in question is St. James Garlic Hythe, and it stands today seemingly marooned amidst a forest of modern office blocks and glass towers. The traffic on the exceedingly busy Upper Thames Street rumbles past it, few of the drivers even noticing it. And yet, St. James Garlic Hythe is special, very special. For one thing, it is a true survivor. Its predecessor fell victim to the full destructive force of the Great Fire of London in 1666. The church was rebuilt to the design of Sir Christopher Wren, who created such a light and airy masterpiece that St. James's is known as Wren's Lantern. The church deftly dodged the Victorian fashion for improving on the past, and it stood resolute as the bombs of two world wars rained down around it, including one explosive that crashed through the roof but which failed to explode. The church even managed to repel an attack by the dreaded Death Watch beetle, an infestation of which was found in the roof timbers in the 1950s, necessitating a closure of almost ten years whilst the pesky little critters were dealt with. Then, just when it seemed that the church could at long last settle into a trouble-free old age, on the morning of Friday the 20th of September, 
1991, a giant crane being used on a building site opposite suddenly buckled and toppled, sending the jib and its 20-ton concrete balancing weight crashing onto the church's roof, ripping a massive hole in it. Amazingly, the crane's operator, William McGrath, managed to leap clear at the very last moment and escaped with nothing more serious than a sprained ankle. He's extremely lucky. Somebody up there loves him, observed one of the ambulance men who attended him in a demonstration of supreme understatement. There can be no doubt about it. The fickle finger of fate has pointed a bony digit at St. James Garlic Hythe time and time again. But each time it has done so, the old boy has simply batted it back and has sent old fate scurrying away with its tail wedged firmly between its legs. OK, I'm getting a little carried away. With such a rich and eventful history, it would be something of a surprise if the church wasn't haunted and St. James Garlic Hythe most certainly doesn't disappoint when it comes to paranormal activity. However, the origins of the hauntings have nothing to do with the aforementioned events. In 1839, workmen excavating under the chancel of the church uncovered the well-preserved remains of a man. According to the book A Camera on Unknown London, published in 1936, it is generally agreed by experts that it is the calcified body of a medieval man, but there is no certainty about the date. Some think it is the body of one Richard Lyon, who was beheaded by Watt Tyler during the Peasants' Revolt at the end of the 14th century. Now, I'll be honest with you, I'm no doctor, and my grasp of human anatomy is, to say the least, somewhat rudimentary, but he doesn't strike me as someone who has had his head chopped off by a rabble of revolting peasants so I think we can park that particular identification. Others hold that he was a Lord Mayor or a city dignitary, a camera of unknown London continued, adding, there are good grounds for this, as the body was found in a fairly elaborate coffin and looked like a man of importance in his own time. It was almost certainly embalmed before burial, is in perfect condition, and is probably the only known example of medieval embalming in the City of London. Whoever he had been in life, it wasn't long before the mysterious cadaver had acquired the nickname Jimmy Garlic, and he had soon become a celebrated fixture at the church, and had been placed inside a case in the vestibule with a salutary note affixed that read, Stop, stranger, as you pass by, as you are now, so once was I, as I am now, so shall you be, so pray, prepare to follow me. There was a time when impish choir boys would remove him from his case on Sunday mornings and sit him in one of the pews with a ruff around his neck, all of which Jimmy accepted with good humour. But in the Second World War, a bomb dropped through the roof of the church, and although it didn't explode, it landed uncomfortably close to Jimmy's cabinet. This appears to have been an indignity too far for old Jimmy Garlick, and his revenant has haunted the church ever since. Not long after the bomb incident, his grey-shrouded form began to be seen around the church. On one occasion, a fire watcher spotted the dark figure of a man walking along the aisle during an air raid. He shouted at him to take cover, only to watch as the figure melted away into thin air. In the 1970s, an American lady and her two young sons visited the church. The elder of the two boys went off to explore on his own. Climbing the stairs that lead to the balcony, he came face to face with a hollow-eyed figure standing with its hands crossed over its chest. The dumbfounded boy was rooted to the spot, but he finally managed to cry out, whereupon the apparition vanished. The appearances seemed to have convinced the authorities that Jimmy should be afforded a little more respect, and he is no longer on display as his mortal remains have now been laid to rest, although the mystery of his identity still lingers on in the church. Before his reinterment, analysis by the British Museum suggested that he was an adolescent who had died in the first half of the 18th century. This has led some to believe that he is or was Seagrave Chamberlain, who died from a fever on the 17th of December 1675, and whose memorial can be seen on the north wall of the church. 
Jimmy was featured in a 2004 Discovery Channel documentary as part of the series Mummy Autopsy. Scientific analysis of his body established that he died between 1641 and 1801, that he suffered with osteoarthritis and tooth decay, and that he was balding, all of which are afflictions that tend to affect older folk, which would of course count against his having been Seagrave Chamberlain. The truth is that Jimmy Garlick's true identity will probably never be known. It is just another of the many mysteries to be encountered as we make our way through London's spectral landscape. Let us next make our way back up Garlic Hill, cautiously cross over several main roads, duck into the narrow bow lane and turn into Groveland Court, where stands Williamson's Tavern, a delightful and hidden away hostelry that has more the feel of a gentleman's club than a city pub. It stands at the exact centre of the City of London, reputedly on the site once occupied by the mansion of Sir John Oldcastle, said to be the model for Shakespeare's full staff. Once the site of the official residence of successive Lord Mayors of London, it was purchased in 1739 by one Robert Williamson, who turned it into a hotel. William Hollis, a North London surveyor, rebuilt it in the 1930s and quickly found that his dabbling may have disturbed some long-ago residents. According to contemporary accounts, queer noises were heard about the premises on Saturday nights. Furthermore, a ghostly figure was often seen gliding from the opposite side of Groveland Court and melting into the brickwork of the pub. Although the apparition never materialised inside the building, the manifestations were often accompanied by an outbreak of poltergeist activity, during which tankards and ashtrays would be hurled to the floor. The disturbances finally proved too much for Mr. Hollis, and thus, according to a report in the City Post, he decided to leave the ghost to its own devices, and the estate is now on the market. The ghostly activity, however, has continued into recent times. Several barmaids have, over the years, refused to be left alone to lock up at night for fear of the spectral goings-on, and there are reports of police dog handlers struggling to persuade their canine charges to enter the passage that leads to the tavern, so terrified are the animals of something they can see or sense within, but which remains invisible to the eyes of their human handlers. There's no doubt about it, Williamson's Tavern is a curious and haunted hostelry. From Queen Victoria Street, you can admire the red brick splendour of another rent church, St Andrew by the Wardrobe, built between 1685 and 1695. The church's unusual name refers to its former proximity to the King's Wardrobe, a set of neighbouring buildings where robes of state and cloth for the royal household were stored until its destruction during the Great Fire of London in 1666, after which the wardrobe was moved to Westminster. In 1933, three bells from the parish church of St. Mary Avonbury in Herefordshire were rehung in the belfry of St. Andrews, and it is with these that our ghost story begins. One of those bells can currently be found in the yard alongside the church, although until the recent renovation of the building got underway, it was displayed inside the church. This is Gabriel, and the sound of this bell would once have sent cold shivers racing down your spine should you ever have had the misfortune to hear it, especially if you happen to be the vicar of St. Mary's in Avonbury. To find out why this should be, let us travel the 170 or so miles to pay a fleeting visit to the tiny hamlet of Avonbury, where we will stand quaking amidst the tumbled-down ruins of the former St. Mary's church. I visited the ruins on a bitterly cold January day in 2010, whilst researching my book Haunted Britain, and I was able to take this rather shaky footage of the site, my unsteady hand being the result not of trepidation or terror, but because the temperature had plummeted as a blizzard was heading towards the churchyard. I had been telling the tale of Gabriel for many years on my ghost walk in London, but this was the first time I had actually visited the source of the story and I must confess that a frizzen tinged with apprehension swept over me a few minutes before the approaching snowstorm did likewise. The gaunt remnants of the church were both chilling and enchanting, and looking at the few surviving walls of its tottering tower, I found it hard to believe that one, let alone three bells, could ever have hung inside it.
But then, I'm no Carolyn Err, so what would I know? Marion C.S. Holborn, the daughter of the last vicar of St. Mary's, the Reverend E. H. Archer, had this to say about the three bells in an article that was published in the American magazine Fate in 1954. Avonbury Church had three beautiful bells, one of which bore a Latin inscription, I am Gabriel, messenger from heaven. The other bells were named, if I remember rightly, Paul and Andrew. But Gabriel was the master. He was the passing bell, and his tolling aided the departing soul and accompanied the body on its last journey to the grave. He was said to toll of his own accord when a vicar died or when tragedy affected the parish. I was living in Scotland when my father died. He had a seizure in church and was carried home on a stretcher. He lived on for ten days, and as his end was not thought to be imminent, I was not sent for in time to see him alive. Our daily help, Sarah, lamented that I had not been summoned earlier. They said they did not know he was dying, she exclaimed indignantly, but they know perfectly well that bell never tolls for nothing. She said that the bell started tolling about nine o'clock in the evening and that it wakened her several times during the night. Sarah was deaf and we always had to shout into her ear, but she heard the bell distinctly. I shall never forget Gabriel's peculiarly deep tone as my father's coffin was carried from the church where he had ministered for thirty-four years. The first stroke of the great bell sent a shudder down my spine. Within the sound there seemed to be a voice, an undertone of awful solemnity and warning. During the days that followed, every member of the family confessed to imagining that they had heard the bell tolling. But except for my mother, we were conscious that it was subjective, coming from within. Every morning when I went to her room, mother told me she had been unable to sleep because of that bell tolling, tolling, tolling all through the night. It affected her health so that I had to hurry my arrangements to take her away from the house. My father was the last vicar of Avonbury. The parish was divided between three neighbouring ones, the church was dismantled, and the bells sold to a London church with the curious name St. Andrew's by the wardrobe. Our aged sexton was almost beside himself. If you sell the bells, he warned, a curse will fall upon the parish. Perhaps his prediction was fulfilled. A few years ago, one of my sons passed through the valley. He found that the church had become a scene of squalor and desecration. In 1933, the bells of St. Mary's were transported to St. Andrew by the wardrobe, and newspapers began speculating about the mystery of a ghost bell. As the Nottingham Evening Post pondered in its edition of Monday the 31st of July, 1933, what is the secret of Gabriel, the ghost bell of Avonbury Church, Herefordshire, which told of its own accord on the deaths of at least two vicars. This is the question that is puzzling the parishioners of St. Andrew by the wardrobe, Blackfriars, following the appearance in the nave of their church of three massive old bells from the Herefordshire village, whose church is being dismantled. Great excitement was caused in St. Andrew's Hill when six men and a crane transported the bells into the church, and now everybody is wondering whether Gabriel will ring out again of its own accord, or whether its secret will remain a secret forever, now that Avonbury has been forsaken for the city. According to an article from a Herefordshire newspaper that used to be displayed inside St. Andrew by the wardrobe, Gabriel is today referred to on a tourist website as one of twelve reasons to leave London. Those living nearby in the years between the wars would never forget the night they were stirred from their slumbers by the knell of a solitary bell. The night was still, no wind was whistling through the tower, and a check of the church revealed that there had been no break-in. The door leading to the belfry was locked. Locals were mystified about what had been happening in their church. The following day, word spread that Gabriel's toll had coincided with the death of the Avonbury clergyman. Spooky, indeed, although following the death of the Reverend E. H. Archer, 
there were no further vicars at Avonbury, so either the departed clergyman was a previous incumbent of the parish, or the story is as tall as St Andrew's Tower. Of course, it is possible that the bell, which was said to also ring out to warn of impending tragedy for the parish, may have tolled in the dead of night on the 28th to the 29th of December, 1940, 24 hours before the bombs of the Blitz rained down on the church and left it a gutted ruin, with only the tower and the walls left standing. That would make sense, although I can find no contemporary accounts to say that the tolling bell story actually happened. The raid did also damage the bells, and two of them were recast and rehung. But Gabriel was never recast, and in consequence it can be admired by all those who pass the church of St. Andrew by the wardrobe. Although just pray that you never hear its dulcet tones. For our next location, we are going to hurry up St Andrew's Hill, cross over Ludgate Hill, head along Ave Maria Lane, and turn left at Amen Corner to stand at the threshold of Amen Court, a delightful little enclave of 17th to 19th century houses. At the rear of the court there looms a large and ominous dark wall, beyond which the fearsome bulk of Newgate Prison once stood, until its demolition in 1902. On the other side of the wall there is a tiny passage, which in the days of the prison was known as Dead Man's Walk, on account of the fact that prisoners were led along it to their executions and were buried beneath it afterwards. This photograph shows the walk when it was in use, and the initials of those buried beneath it can be seen carved into the wall on the left. Although many ghostly tales have evolved around the sinister old wall, the most chilling is that of the Black Dog of Newgate. This shapeless black something or other is said to shuffle along the top of the wall, slither down into the courtyard, and then melt away. Its manifestations are said to always be accompanied by a nauseous smell, and are often accompanied by the sound of dragging footsteps coming from the other side of the wall. Its origins are said to date back to the reign of Henry III, when a fearsome famine struck London, and the poor felons incarcerated within Newgate Prison faced with the prospect of painful starvation, turned to cannibalism as a means of survival. One day, a scholar was imprisoned there on charges of sorcery. His portly figure proved too much of a temptation for the older inmates, and within a few days they had killed and devoured him, pronouncing him to be good meat. However, they soon had cause to regret their actions, for a hideous black dog with eyes of fire and jowls that dripped with blood appeared to them in the dead of night and proceeded to exact a terrifying revenge. Some hapless prisoners were torn limb from limb by the ferocious beast, and their anguished screams echoed through the jail, striking terror into the very souls of the other inmates. Others simply died of the fright when they heard its ghostly panting along with the heavy thud of its paws padding towards them across the cold stone floors of the prison. Those who survived the first nights of its lust for blood and vengeance became so terrified that they killed their guards and escaped. But no matter how far they travelled, the beast hunted them down one by one. Only when the murder of its master, the sorcerer, had been fully avenged did it return to the prison's fetid dungeons, where it became a hideous harbinger of death, always appearing on the eve of an execution or on the nights before felons breathed their last. When the prison was demolished in 1902, it was hoped beyond hope that the black dog would become a thing of the past. But it was not to be. For some people walking in Amen Court at night who happened to glance at the wall have reported seeing a dark shape shuffling across the top. As they watch, it slithers down into the courtyard and then disappears before their very eyes, leaving a horrible stench of decay in its ghostly wake. Another spectre associated with the other side of the wall is that of Amelia Dyer the odious Reading baby farmer. 
paid to look after unwanted babies, this evil woman chose to drown her charges in the Thames and other rivers, whilst continuing to draw an income for their supposed upkeep. Brought to justice, she was sentenced to death, and on the 10th of June, 1896, she took her final stroll along Dead Man's Walk. As she did so, she passed a young warder by the name of Mr. Scott. Stopping abruptly, she turned slowly towards him. Her small, dark eyes looked into his, her face cracked into a toothless smile, and in a low, rasping voice, she sneered. I'll meet you again some day, sir. Moments later, she was dead, dangling at the end of the hangman's rope. Six years passed, Scott progressed in his chosen career, and memories of Amelia Dyer and her chilling promise were all but forgotten. Then, one night, just before the prison was due to close prior to its demolition, he found himself alone in the warder's room, his back to the grill that looked out onto Dead Man's Walk. Suddenly, a cold shiver ran down his spine, and he got the distinct impression that someone was watching him. And then he heard it that low, sneering rasp as the unmistakable voice of Mrs. Dyer echoed from the passage. Meet you again, meet you again, meet you again, meet you again. Turning, he saw her evil face framed by the grill grinning at him. Stirred to action, he rushed towards her, but she promptly vanished. Throwing open the door, he found that the passage was silent and empty. Had he imagined it? Possibly. Yet he could never account for the woman's handkerchief, which at that very moment fluttered to the flagstones and lay still at his feet. From a place of death and decay, we move on to a place of hope and healing as we proceed in a northerly direction to arrive at St. Bartholomew's Hospital, or Barts, as it is universally known, which has the distinction of being the oldest hospital in London to still stand on its original site. It dates back to 1123, when it was founded as part of the monastery of St. Bartholomew. In the Queen Mary Nurses Home, which sadly was demolished in the early 2000s, there used to be an elevator which generations of doctors and nurses came to know as the Coffin Lift. In the silent hours of early mornings, it was known to take bemused passengers down to the basement, irrespective of which floor they had actually pressed for. Once there, its lights would go out and it would not move. After a few moments of madly pushing the buttons, staff would pull open the gates and head up the stairs back to the ground floor. Here they would find the lift waiting, its gates open and its lights on. Should they then choose to walk up to the required level, they would suffer the unnerving experience of having the elevator follow them up the lift shaft around which the staircase twisted. Tradition maintains that the ghost of a nurse who was murdered in the lift in the basement by a deranged patient was responsible for the malfunction, although I have to confess that I have been unable to find any evidence of such a crime ever having occurred at the hospital. The spirits of former nurses are also said to haunt other parts of the buildings. Grace Ward, which has also now been demolished, was the spectral domain of the Grey Lady, a nurse in old-fashioned uniform who in life was said to have administered a fatal overdose to a patient and to have killed herself in remorse. Whenever a nurse was about to make a similar mistake, they would feel a light tap on their shoulder, and looking up, they would see the Grey Lady shaking her head in warning. A similarly attired lady was seen on Bedford Fenwick Ward, although she appeared to administer comfort as opposed to warning. At night, patients would sometimes ask nurses working on the ward to thank the old-fashioned nurse for having brought them a cup of tea, even though no such nurse was on the ward and no cup of tea was in evidence. In her book of Sluices and Sisters, Alison Collin, who trained as a nurse at Bart's in the mid-1960s, recalls how Almost everyone who did night duty on the old block theatres remembers them as being very spooky. She quotes a colleague, Viv Hart, as remembering that They were eerie places to work at night. There was reputedly a theatre ghost, Jasmine, on the first floor, supposedly an old theatre sister, 
who used to check that everything was as she liked it, and if not, would move the furniture around. Certainly odd things did happen, and the porters hated coming out of their room at night. I remember one quiet night when we were having a quick kip in different parts of the theatre, I was on the operating table, when we heard footsteps tapping down the corridor. However, nobody appeared, and we realised that the noise came from the floor above, supposedly locked. We then heard furniture being moved around. We called the porters to go and investigate, but they were too scared. There was an old cockney cleaner who cleaned the back stairs every morning, and she stated very matter-of-factly that she often felt the draught and then smelt Jasmine's perfume as she swept by her on the stairs. Barts is certainly a special place, and when you think of all the historical events that must have taken place on and around its site over the last 900 years, I suppose it is inevitable that a few of those who have had associations with it have chosen to linger behind in spirit form. Our next haunted site is located just outside the hospital on West Smithfield, dominated by Smithfield Meat Market, the current buildings of which date from the late 19th century, although there has been a market here for more than 800 years. Sadly, the historic market will soon start moving to a new state-of-the-art complex at Dagenham, and by 2028, Smithfield Market will be little more than a memory, although the buildings are in the process of being taken over by the Museum of London, so it's not all bad, and if you're vegetarian, then it's excellent news indeed. The Smooth Field, as Smithfield was originally known, was for centuries one of London's places of execution. In August 1305, Sir William Wallace, Braveheart, was put to death here, and a plaque on the wall of St. Bartholomew's Hospital commemorates his heroic exploits. In the reign of Queen Mary Tudor, 29 Protestant martyrs were burned at the stake here, in what history remembers as the fires of Smithfield. Bloody Mary was emphatic that green wood should not be used, since its smoke was likely to suffocate the victims before they suffered the full agony of the flames. We can only guess at the terrible suffering endured by those who perished here. For some of the victims, the torment appears to have proved eternal, and those who work in the area in the early hours of the morning have sometimes been disturbed by anguished and agonised screams that rend the air as the sickly smell of burning flesh is carried upon the night breezes. Hidden behind a Tudor gatehouse which faces out onto West Smithfield, the Priory Church of St. Bartholomew the Great is the oldest parish church in London. It possesses a dark and mysterious interior, the ancient walls of which drip with atmosphere. It has been used as a location for films as diverse as Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, Four Weddings and a Funeral, Shakespeare in Love, Transformers, The Last Night, and Avengers, Age of Ultron, to name but a few. If you ask me, there could be no better location in which to shoot a Hollywood blockbuster, although I'm no Steven Spielberg, but then neither is Martin Scorsese. The church's ambience has been described as the holy gloom, and it comes as little surprise to learn that the building is haunted. Even its beginnings are tinged with the supernatural. Ray here, a man who, according to legend, was once a jester at the court of King Henry I, founded it in 1123. In November 1120, the king's only son and heir had been drowned when the white ship was lost in a winter storm off Calais. The royal court was plunged into despondency, and Rehir opted to become a monk and set off on a pilgrimage to Rome. Whilst there, he fell dangerously ill with malaria and vowed that, if he were cured and allowed to return to his own country, he would erect a hospital for the restoration of poor men. Miraculously, Rehir's prayer was answered, and he duly set off back to England. But on the way, he had a terrible dream in which he was seized by a fearful winged creature and taken up onto a high ledge where he was set down, teetering on the brink of a yawning chasm. Just as he was about to fall, the radiant figure of St. Bartholomew appeared at his side and told Rahir that he had come to save him. In return, said the saint, in my name thou shalt found a church in London at Smedfeld. 
Smetfeld was, of course, the Smooth Field or Smithfield, and Rahir duly founded his church and hospital there in 1123, and when he died in 1145, he was buried inside the church. His tomb can still be seen to the side of the altar, its reverse side clearly showing the results of a hasty repair carried out in the 19th century when the parish officials reputedly decided to report upon the state of the founder's body. It was well preserved, and even the clothes and sandals are said to have been intact. A few days after the tomb had been sealed, one of the church officers fell ill and confessed that when the tomb had been open, he had stolen one of the sandals. He gave it back and recovered, but it was never returned to the foot of its rightful owner, and from that day Rahir has haunted the church as a shadowy hooded figure who appears from the gloom, brushes past astonished witnesses, and fades slowly away into thin air. The Reverend William Fitzgerald Gambia Sandwith became rector of the church on the 20th of January 1907, and both he and his wife had several paranormal encounters inside the building. In her book, Ghosts Vivisected, published in 1957, A. M. W. Sterling recounted several of their experiences. One Christmas Eve, Mrs. Sandwith was arranging flowers at the altar in the church when she heard a faint sound behind her, and looking round she saw the figure of a monk standing at a little distance. His cowl was drawn over his head, and his face was invisible. She spoke to him, but he did not answer, and as she watched him he glided away noiselessly into the vestry. She at once followed, but to her astonishment found no one there, whereupon she went home and told her husband of her uncanny experience. The next day, Christmas Day, said Mr. Sandwith, continuing his wife's story, I was celebrating Holy Communion when I looked up, and to my astonishment, on the capital of one of the pillars adjacent, apparently looking down at me, was a monk's face encircled by a cowl. I was so amazed that I paused in the middle of the service, and only when I became aware that the congregation were looking at me in surprise did I continue, while the face above me faded away. But the curious thing was that my wife saw the body of the apparition without the face, and I saw the face without the body. A few years afterwards Mrs. Sterling and her husband happened to stroll into St. Bartholomew's Church one afternoon, and there they encountered the Reverend Sandwith. Chatting with him, Mrs. Sterling asked if he had had any further psychic experiences since their last meeting. "'Well, yes,' replied Mr. Sandwith. I had a most strange thing happen the other day. I was taking two ladies round the church, and quite suddenly, looking at the pulpit, I saw in it a man in the black gown of Geneva, evidently a divine of the Reformation period, preaching away most earnestly to an invisible congregation. No sound was to be heard, but he appeared to be exhorting the unseen audience with the greatest fervour, gesticulating vehemently bending first to the right, then to the left over the pulpit, thumping the cushions in front of him, and all the while his lips moving as though speech was pouring from them. I looked at him in some dismay, because I was afraid that the ladies who were with me might be upset, but as the moments passed and they made no remark about the apparition, I determined to ascertain whether they did or did not see it. With this object I pointed straight at the pulpit where the man was preaching and remarked, I don't think that pulpit is quite worthy of the church, do you? No, perhaps not, she replied without further comment, and after a while I turned to her companion and pointed to a monument near the pulpit. That is a very interesting old Jacobean effigy there, I remarked, thus making her also look in the direction of the pulpit. She agreed with me indifferently in a manner which showed me conclusively that she saw nothing unusual in the direction to which I thus caused her to look. Yet for fully a quarter of an hour I remained in the church, seeing that man in the pulpit as clearly as I see you beside me. Mrs. Sterling finished her account by stating, Mr. Sandwith at that date asked me not to make public his experience thus related, as he dreaded a consequent influx of journalists and tourists. I, however, wrote his account down verbatim on my return home, and since he is now dead and the episode is long past, 
I feel at liberty to recount it precisely as my husband and I heard it related by him when it was a recent experience. The hauntings at St. Bartholomew the Great have continued into recent times. In May 1999, the then verger of the church who lived in the house next door was woken early one morning by a telephone call from the security company informing him that the alarms were going off inside the church. Entering the building, he turned on the lights and conducted a brief search. The church was empty. Switching the lights off, he was about to leave when he clearly heard the measured tread of slapping footsteps walking down the central aisle. He called out, Who's there? Whereupon the footsteps stopped for a moment, but then they resumed, continuing along the aisle. Convinced there was an intruder, he locked the doors and called the police. They arrived within minutes, but could find no sign of anyone inside the building. Furthermore, no windows or doors were open. The next morning, the alarm company sent an engineer to check and reset the motion-triggered alarms. Both he and the verger were astonished to discover that only the central beam, the one that passes Rahir's tomb, had been broken. The beams by the doors and the side and top aisles had not been breached, meaning that whatever or whoever was responsible had somehow managed to simply appear at the centre of the church. It was then that the verger remembered that the footsteps had sounded like sandals slapping over the stone floor of the church. St. Bartholomew the Great is one of the most atmospheric and spiritual places you could imagine, and the mark of history is most certainly upon it. And as you explore its dark corners and shadowy recesses, should you happen to encounter the cowled figure of a monk without a face, or the face of a monk without a body, count yourself honoured that the oldest resident of this historic church has granted you a ghostly audience. Leaving the Church of St. Bartholomew the Great to its memories and its shadows, we turn our attention eastwards as we stroll along London Wall, off which segments of the old city walls, part Roman, part medieval, await our discovery. In April 1907, a letter appeared in the city press concerning this section of wall. A reader told how, on one Sunday night, he had been passing this relic when he noticed a hand and arm stretched out from the railings to bar my passage. He was so alarmed by this that he jumped into the road and for a moment turned his back on the strange apparition. On summoning up the courage to look round, he saw the figure of a man in dark clothes walking back towards the wall, and on reaching it, the man seemed to walk right into it. The bemused witness recalled how he had heard no sound of footsteps and told how he had returned the next morning to examine the spot, but could find nothing that threw any light on the mystery of who or what it was that he had encountered. Our final haunted hotspot takes us to Moorgate, where we enter Bunhill Fields, a burial ground that is crammed with an eclectic mix of tombs and gravestones. Its name is thought to be a derivation of Bonehill, and since there was no proof that the ground here had ever been consecrated, it became a favoured place of interment for nonconformists who were able to bury their dead without the use of the common prayer book. John Bunyan, Daniel Defoe, and William Blake are just a few of those whose graves are now shaded by soaring plane trees. One tomb that has always intrigued me is that of Dame Mary Page, who departed this life on March the 4th, 1728, and who, according to the inscription on her tomb, in 67 months was tapped 66 times, had taken away 240 gallons of water without ever repining at her case or ever fearing the operation. Dame Mary was afflicted with a form of dropsy that caused excess fluid to build up around her lungs, hence the need to remove the equivalent of 1,920 pints of water from her chest, which must have been an awful experience for the poor woman. But she bore the procedure stoically and never once repined at her case. Although no burials have taken place here since 1854, the Corporation of London still maintains the ground for public usage and employs several gardeners to ensure that this vast necropolis remains in pristine condition. 
In June 2001, several of the gardeners complained of experiencing supernatural phenomena. Things have gone a bit haywire in the last ten months, one of them told the Highbury and Islington Gazette. Loads of weird stuff has started happening. He recounted that steam had been seen rising from graves. Several other gardeners spoke of encountering a cloaked woman who suddenly disappeared without trace, whilst floods of water would suddenly appear from nowhere, even on dry days. Meanwhile, the gardener's hut, which had long been considered a safe haven from whatever supernatural forces were loose in the fields, began to suffer the attentions of the ghostly residents. A gardener told how he had locked the door one morning and had found, All our posters and notices had been mysteriously taken down and arranged neatly on the floor in exactly the same order. Strange handprints had also appeared on the table, which certainly did not belong to any of the staff. Asked if he had any idea who or what was responsible for the activity, the gardener could only shrug his shoulders and express his utter bemusement. And so our journey through the haunted city draws to its conclusion as the sun comes up over the timeless streets and the souls of previous times beat a hasty retreat to wherever it is they spend their daylight hours. Apart from, of course, those revenants who actually appear during the daylight hours, in which case they just stay put and wait for an unsuspecting mortal to come blundering into their spectral orbit. There are, of course, many more haunted locations dotted around the City of London, but the ones featured in this video offer, I hope, a decent cross-section of spectres that can be found floating around the streets and buildings. Their stories are chilling, fascinating and enthralling. The places they haunt are atmospheric, absorbing and occasionally enchanting. But they all serve to remind us of just how fleeting our time upon this earth truly is. For as Shakespeare put it, We are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. I'll drink to that. <laughs>